is a, is a really cool day for me. I love it when we have a variety of speakers here at Bethel. We believe that uh, you shouldn't just hear one voice all the time, but we have different people come and, and share, uh, typically uh, the pastors here. But a friend of mine is going to be speaking today. Uh, he's one of our one of our very own, uh, Bethel. You guys, if you've been in Bethel U, you've uh, been under his teaching, uh, but he's a great guy. Derek, why don't you come and uh, introduce yourself for those that don't know you. And then Derek is going to share today John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter chapter one, uh, the Bible app as well. It'll be on the screens as well. And uh, Derek's going to come introduce himself and uh, share what God has done uh, today. You got it? You I on? think so. All right. Yeah. Technology, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't shake your hand because I just unplugged myself. All right. Just put it in your back pocket. I think I'm still on. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, so this is Derek. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump into John chapter 1 uh, with our series called Dwell. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for Derek and his uh, willingness to be used. And God, the preparation, the study, and the, and the delivery, I pray that your hand would be all over it. God, that you would work through the service, that your spirit would draw us closer to you, uh, realizing that you came to dwell with us. We, we love you. We're thankful. Uh, now put your hand on Derek and use him today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm a... I am excited. I'm thankful to be able to uh, be up here and uh, preach you to this this morning. Uh, honestly, uh, I wasn't sure uh, if I'd ever end up behind the metaphorical pulpit uh, anymore, but I'm, I'm glad it's happened. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Derek Pemberton. I have uh, my wife and daughter, uh, Jamie and Elena here. Uh, Leland will make his way on. He's the one on the motorcycle. So you'll see him uh, for second service, then our niece, uh, Miracle, and the tweens right now. Uh, so before we get started, I do want to, to give somewhat of a warning. There will be a story that I tell later on in this sermon that does involve uh, a, a story about child abuse. All right, and I understand that there are, I know people in here, and there are probably many more that I don't know that have experienced that uh, themselves or through uh, with somebody that they have loved, and I don't want it to be re-traumatizing. I'm going to try to do it as sensitively as possible, but I hope uh, that in the process of that, you will hear uh, the voice of your shepherd uh, anew. All right, and I will be reading from, the, we usually use the New Living, I will read from the NIV uh, this morning, only because there are certain parts of this particular passage that it interprets or translates uh, especially well. So John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 1 verse uh, 1 through 18 is John's introduction to his gospel, the story that he had witnessed unfolding. And he begins in verse 1. He says, the be in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. I mean, imagine that. The creator comes to his creation, and we, we didn't recognize who he was. He came to that which was his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And we'll focus our attention here this morning that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, out of his fullness we have see, received grace in place of grace already given. And this is important for John's introduction. It's important for his entire gospel that the grace that came in Jesus, the glory that was manifested in Jesus, replaced 
what had come before. And what was that? Well, he says in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then he ties up his introduction by going back to the beginning. He says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God, the word was God, and is in closest relationship with the father, the word was with God, has made him known. So I had lost my faith uh, not a terribly long time ago. Have any of y'all ever done that or been on the verge, at least, of, of doing that? The world that I thought that God had ordered for me and the way that I saw him and I believed he was uh, making his presence known with me was, was all shaken. It, it crumbled apart. People left me, people died, all the things that I thought were supposed to happen and that God was leading to happen, all came to naught. I really had known Jesus, but only in part, just like it is with, with any of us. But there came a time when I could no longer recognize his voice. I could no longer recognize or see him where I was, and, but in the process of time, I began, somehow, he, he reached down, and I, I heard his voice again. It was the same voice, but it was different. And this is the type of situation that John is writing into. Sometimes, God seems far, far removed from us. All the things that we thought were supposed to be evidence of his presence are no longer there. And we have to figure out what to make of that, where to turn then. And so John, he sits down to write this gospel probably a decade or so after Jerusalem and the temple had been completely destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. The focal point of their religious and spiritual existence, Jerusalem and the temple, were no longer there. The place where God dwelt on this earth had been destroyed. The place that they were expecting the Messiah to imminently return was no longer ready for them. And so they, the Jews throughout the Roman Empire, found themselves a little destabilized. And not only them, but Christians throughout the Roman Empire at that time. See, outside of Judea, where there was a lot more hostility that brewed early on for the Christian faith, throughout the rest of the empire, many of the Christians still associated themselves with synagogues. They were still welcome, kind of as, as that, that weird cousin. They were still welcome. But after 70 AD, after the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem, there was an increasing hostility towards them from the synagogue. And eventually they were removed from that. And so even they were having to reorient their lives a bit, uh, given the fact that they were no longer connected to this community that they were once connected to. Well, John has a story to tell them both. One that he himself had witnessed transpiring decades and decades before. God hadn't moved further from them. He had moved closer. That the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He moved closer. Now him dwelling among us and among his people wasn't anything particularly new for the Jews. Because he had dwelt with them. So in Exodus chapter 25, God tells Moses that there the Israelites are to make a sanctuary for them, a tabernacle that would eventually be a temple. Make a sanctuary for him so that he could dwell among them. And so they were familiar with this. There was in the middle of that temple, in that uh, uh, tabernacle, a, a cube that was the center point, the centerpiece of the tabernacle. 
and the temple. That was where God would dwell. But it was limited. Only one time a year could one designated Jewish priest from a specific tribe and a specific family in that tribe who was ritualistically clean, was able-bodied, only that person one time a year could enter into that space. Nobody who was unclean, nobody who had a messy life, nobody who was disabled, nobody who was sick could enter into that space. And so that, that dwelling place of God was limited. But now it was just gone. The place that all Jews in the world had turned was gone. So the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it was definitely the judgment of God upon the Jews, but it was not evidence that God had removed himself. In fact, what John had witnessed in the story that he tells tells something quite the opposite. That God hadn't moved away from them. He had drawn near. No longer did they have to travel to or point to this place where God dwelt far off. But he had come to them and dwelt among them in a way that nobody had ever imagined. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Literally, it means that he pitched his tabernacle among us. He tabernacled among us. And John emphasizes this here in his introduction and throughout his gospel in several ways. Sometimes, uh, and not only does he mention it here, but he also takes events in Jesus' life and ministry and moves them toward the beginning and emphasizes them and explains them in a way that the other gospel writers hadn't. He adds events that the other gospel writers didn't. An example of this is when he took uh, Jesus' clearing of the temple, of the money changers, and he moves it toward the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's one of the first things that Jesus does in John's gospel. He clears the temple. The religious leaders there are upset with him, and he tells them, you destroy this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. John gives an explanation for that. And he says he was speaking of the temple of his body. Even his disciples didn't understand that until after the fact, after the resurrection. And then just a short time later in his retelling of the story of Jesus, Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well in John chapter 4. And the the Samaritan woman, a half-breed Jew, a sinner among sinners as far as the Jews were concerned. And he's meeting with her there at this well. And she asks him, recognizing that there's something odd about him, there's something special about him. He, she asks him, you know, our people, they worship on this mountain. But the Jews say that you have to worship in Jerusalem or toward Jerusalem. And he tells her, Listen, there's coming a time when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And so John, as he's telling this story, as he's introducing them to this gospel, is giving his witness to something that he himself had experienced with Jesus and is testifying to these Jews spread across the empire at that time that Jerusalem and the temple were irrelevant for them now because the Messiah is Jesus, God, who took on flesh and dwelt among us. He himself is the center of our devotion, and he came to be with us. 
whatever was destroyed, whatever evidence you had that God dwelt among you, and whatever evidence you think you have that God had moved away from you, just is not the case. He's drawn near to us. Again, in a way that they never could have imagined. Similar things are mentioned throughout his gospel. He goes deep into this well of Jewish images and festivals and shows how Jesus, dwelling among us, fulfills them all. That Jesus is the serpent in the wilderness. That the wandering Jews in the wilderness could look to for healing. He is the manna from heaven that sustains his people. He is the focal point that Jacob's ladder rises and falls on. He is the light of the world. He is the Passover lamb. He is the temple. He is the tabernacle. He is the living water. He is all of these things, all of the things that they looked for, all of the evidence that they looked for, that God was with us or fulfilled, he says, in this man, Jesus, the Messiah. That the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And he says in verse 16 and 17, out of his fullness, we've received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He moved closer and he revealed his glory in a completely unexpected way. So I've had this type of experience over the past decade in particular where I expected God to look and to sound a certain way. I expected that he would act and order my world in a certain way. And then something would happen or something would be lost. And all of that was disorienting. I found myself no longer able to see or recognize God, because I expected him to act and to look a certain way. But then, again, he would reach down to me in my despair, and I'd hear this whisper of a voice again. And I'd learn that his glory was different than I had once realized. For John's audience, Jesus fulfills all the structures, all the celebrations that were recognized as evidence of God's presence among his people. They were wiped away. But John says, it's okay. Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I've been there. I've had all these things that I once held on to as the evidence of God's presence with me, that all seemingly in a moment just disintegrated. I had a church family to which I belonged and was even a prominent part that rejected me. Friends rejected me. People were lost. People died. All the things that I took as God ordering the path before me uh, came to naught. The calling that I had from God just left. It was gone. And I couldn't see him anymore. The evidence that I thought I had seen of the glory of God manifested in all these different ways in my life just turned to darkness. And just as the Jews in the gospel couldn't see the glory of God before them, right before their eyes in Jesus, because he didn't fit into the box that he, they had prepared for him, I had lost my faith. For the same reasons. I was disappointed. I was disillusioned enough that I assumed that God was far from me. Or maybe that he didn't even exist. But then he would show me a glory that I hadn't seen before as clearly as I did then. 
And in John, this idea of the glory of God is, is really important. And, and he shows how the glory of God was displayed through different signs that Jesus did. Seven signs in particular, starting there uh, in the marriage of Cana, where he turns water into wine, and then ending with the raising of Lazarus, that all of these were signs and evidence of the glory of God. But for John, these were not the ultimate expressions and manifestations of the glory of God. Instead, for John, throughout his gospel, and then on into the book of Revelation, he shows that the glory of God was supremely manifested not in all of these signs and miracles that he did, but when he was lifted up on a cross and died, bearing all of our sins, all of our shame, all of our remorse, all of our brokenness and sickness and death, all of the evil of the world cast upon him, that was when we saw his glory in its fullest. Something nobody in the world had expected. That wasn't the evidence of the glory of God that anybody on this planet was ever looking for. That's not what any religion on this planet displays is the glory of their God. But for John in particular, when he talks about the glory of God, that is where it points. That Jesus in chapter 12 of John, as he's saying, he says finally that my hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he's not just talking about that time when he gets resurrected, which is certainly an evidence of glory. He follows that up with, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And what he is saying, that the Son of God, that word become flesh, displays the glory of God in its fullest, not in these miraculous signs, but he's, he's lifted up on a cross and draws all people to himself. And as I was dwelling in, in the Gospel of John in preparation uh, for this, a story that I had read before came to my mind. It's a story that somebody had told a, a pastor and theologian, Greg Boyd, and it was uh, a man who... Uh, was a worker in a Christ-centered uh, home for traumatized orphans. Almost all of those who come to their home have some significant history of trauma from uh, physical and emotional, sexual, spiritual abuse and neglect. Many of them have traveled from home to home and placement to placement over 30 times before they get to their home. One day, a girl came to them, scared. Ten-year-old girl, every night, she would smear her feces on the walls of her room. Their house parents wouldn't discover this till the next morning. And it was obviously disturbing to everybody. But as time went on, they discovered more of this girl's story. Every night, she would be abused by her father. As this happened over and over, her body started unintentionally defecating during those times. What would happen then is her father would be so disgusted that he would turn and leave. What she discovered was that if she smeared it on the walls, it would have the same effect. And so she took that defense mechanism there to that house. And fortunately, they dealt with it in a way that probably her previous placement hadn't. They could have done what probably many others had done, and that is to try to stop that behavior as soon as they could. This is not acceptable. It has to stop as, as soon as possible. 
some, uh, some corrective action, whatever. But for her, all that that would have meant is she's not safe here. She can't trust these people. She's not welcome. They're ashamed of her. And, but they didn't do that. And he's, as he was talking to a friend about that experience and that girl in relation to the love of God, he had said, what if true love simply lets her smear the poop on the walls at first? His friend responded, what if true love actually smears the poop with her? That what if the greatest manifestation of love isn't to join her in some sin or anything like that, but to get down with her, relate to her brokenness, take on all the mess with her, and smear the poop with her. And show her that you're not ashamed of her and you're willing to get down with her, whatever she's been through, however broken she is, to feel it with her and to experience it with her. Now, those looking from the outside at that moment would view it as utterly dysfunctional, right? Even sinful. But God hasn't moved far away from our mess. Hasn't moved far away from our sin and brokenness and sickness and disorientation. Even in our rejection of him, he has drawn close. That the word became flesh and made his dwelling among this messy people. And he's dwelt with us in different ways at different times. He dwelt with us in the garden whenever he created. And then he assigned us to be his representatives, his caretakers of his good creation with which he dwelt. But we messed that up. We rebelled against him. We rejected his plan, his purposes for us and for his good creation. And he exiled us from his presence and from the garden, but then showed up again in temples and tabernacles, but only in a limited way, still separated from our mass. But when the fullness of time had come, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then someday, he will dwell again with us in his fullness on this earth with zero restriction, which we'll talk about next week. And right now, he dwells with us in his spirit. He dwells in his messy people and churches as they work alongside him to point others to that new creation. And that all seems for... I suppose everybody who would hear it for the first time, just unbelievable. Uh, Who could imagine that that represents the greatness of the glory of God? And the apostles also found themselves having a hard time believing that. For those of us who have received him already, even that expression of his glory could even be unbelievable to us. And maybe you say that I struggle to believe him because I wasn't there. I didn't see all the signs and everything that he had performed. Well, John writes for you. Keep in mind that the people he was writing for weren't like him. They didn't witness all of these things. They weren't there to see it all unfold. He's the witness, and he's telling them what happened. But they were a generation or two removed from that in a different uh, place geographically than where it actually took place. And so he ends his gospel with, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Because in the retelling of that story, the good news... The story of God coming to dwell with his people again 
they heard the voice of a shepherd. And they believed. We weren't there, but we can still hear that voice. And just as the answer for all of the Jews' religious hopes and signs found their fulfillment in Jesus, so do ours. We, we don't look to temples, right? Uh, we don't have those types of focal points for our faith. But all of us probably to some degree or another do have things that are in our lives that we take as evidence that God is with us. And when those things get removed, whether it's people that are important to us in our faith that leave or die, whether it's things that ought to have turned out one way, but they turn out a different way instead. And we assume it means that God has removed himself from us. If what God, John says in his gospel, what he witnessed is true, then that is not the case. God didn't and hasn't and won't remove himself. From us. He has drawn near. And in all of that brokenness, in all of that confusion, in all of those losses, He is the only one who understands. He's the only one who has experienced it with us. He's the only one who can identify with you. And He's got down into all of the mess, into all of our confusion, even as we have outstretched arms rejecting him, he has come to us in it. And he has dwelt in us and has made himself available to us because his glory was supremely manifested like that. Not in all things turning out the way that we want them to now, but like that. I don't know what to make of cancers and deaths and losses, but I know a God who dwells with us in them. And the good shepherd, that good shepherd, is calling some of you today, maybe for the first time. Maybe you're hearing this, and it still seems incredible, and you're not sure what to make of it, but something in it rings true, and you can't explain why. Something in that is beautiful, even if you can't explain why. And he's calling you, and you don't know what to make of it, and it's scary. This morning, you can receive your creator. You can be one that recognizes him. John warns the unbelieving Jews that he's writing to, don't be like the Jews in Judea, in Palestine, during the ministry of Jesus, that when he was right in front of them, they didn't receive him because he didn't fit into their boxes. Receive, recognize your creator, believe, and he will dwell with you. And those of us who believe already, maybe you were, you were taught and you were brought up on a God whose glory wasn't manifested supremely in that way. And you've lost some things. You've been disoriented. You're not sure where he is. It seems he's far from you. Hear the voice of your good shepherd anew. And today, Draw near to him again, because that voice is drawing you to him. And so, as we prepare to worship again, in your seats, with your neighbor, in the prayer team in the back, get somebody, pray for you, pray with you as you receive him, or draw him closer, allow him to draw closer to you again. Or just in your seat, just you and your shepherd, that one on the cross. Receive him anew or receive him for the first time today because he wants to dwell with you. He wants to dwell with me. Regardless of where you are or where you have been, how messy things seem, how disoriented you feel, he understands and he will dwell with you.
Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the fact that you have done something that was completely unexpected and refreshing and compelling. And even though we don't understand all that you are doing in this world that seems to be imploding on itself at times, that we know that you haven't moved further away from us, but you have drawn near. And you, your Son, incarnated in the flesh, dwelling among us, is and will always be the focal point of our worship and devotion, regardless of what is going on around us. I pray that you call us again today with that voice anew and that we would receive you. In Jesus' name.